You will be working with patients, people, doctor. When you say people, you mean living people? You do want the job, don't you? Hi. I'm Dr. Sayer. I'm Wahida. Wahida. I'd like to ask... I was born in 1911 in Kingsbridge, New York. Prior to July 1955, I resided at the Brooklyn Psychiatric Center, Brooklyn, New York. How are you today? I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> I was a person. <laughs> Nominated for three Academy Awards. It gets easier. You don't think it will, but it does. Hailed by critics worldwide. Can you hear me? Does he ever speak to you? Of course not. Not in words. No change. Day to 9-11-44. Your patients, doctor, haven't moved in decades. What I believe. What I know. These people are alive inside. Well, how do you know that, Doctor? I know it. At 200 milligrams, he showed no response. Maybe he needs more. Maybe he needs less. Dr. Sayer, it's a miracle. Where are my glasses? They're on your face. Awakenings. The movie applauds the strength, the courage, and the true essence of the human spirit. Stars Academy Award winner Robert De Niro. There was a guy who I worked with who was very helpful, and he would be frozen, and then he'd come, come alive. And his movements were... I studied them a lot. You know, I videoed them uh, a few times, and then I would just play them over and over again. You thought what you'd like to do today? Everything. Robin Williams. It was weird, I was reading it on a plane. I was, I was some woman I started sobbing and some woman thought I was having a breakdown. It's more about the story and the patience and the interrelation of particularly one patient and myself and that kind of thing where you go beyond the bounds of medicine when it becomes a friend, when you actually become connected to a patient and it is personal and you have a friendship there, but there is more at stake. You're not married. Me. And directed by Penny Marshall. The script was based on the novel written by Dr. Oliver Sacks called Awakenings. I read it and it moved me. I was shooting scenes, you know, from when I first read them, I said, really? But most importantly, Awakenings is based on a real life story. Real people who spent most of their lives frozen in empty spaces, lost inside the abyss. She has no other living relatives and they say she has always been as she is now, with no response or comprehension. And yet... One gifted doctor, Dr. Oliver Sacks, carefully recorded and witnessed a precious miracle, which he so aptly compared to Ibsen's play, When We Dead Awaken. And these were people who had come to a stop, who had, in a way, lost out on life in a terrible way, who had been out of the world for 30 or 40 years, but um, they weren't bitter. They were funny, they were courageous, they were tough, they were real people. And uh, it seems to me amazing and inspiring that, the, that a human being can go through such an experience, can go through hell in a way, and yet show such a spirit. These are his patients, and this is their amazing story recorded some 20 years ago. Awakenings, more than a movie. In 1966, Dr. Oliver Sacks arrived at Beth Abraham Hospital in New York. He was to care for 80 or more patients who had been regarded as effectively dead. They had become as passive as zombies. The notion that all of us live in the same world and that distance and duration and the feel of things, the appearance of things, is something constant. This was absolutely shattered, and I would say it was shattered in a flash by seeing these people uh, um, who obviously lived in, um, in a way, in extremely distorted worlds, and often fantastically distorted worlds, with all the, all the distortions which, uh, which one finds in, in Alice. It, 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 it was very much uh, Alice-like wonderland. One night in 1926, Sylvia dreamed the world had come to a stop. She dreamed she was a living statue of stone. By morning, the nightmare had come true. At 30, Lola was an active housewife. 
Six years later, rigid and almost speechless, she wrote, I'm finished. There's nothing else to do. Both Sylvia and Lola were victims of one of the strangest epidemics of our time. At the end of the First World War came alarming reports of a bizarre disease. Doctors were baffled worldwide. They called the disease sleepy sickness after its most common symptom, a trance-like state which overcame its victims for years. No cure was ever found. In Switzerland, a bride fell asleep at the altar. In France, not even childbirth could awaken one mother. As the epidemic spread, other symptoms multiplied. The more seriously affected suffered the shortest agony. During the 1920s, more than one million people were affected by sleepy sickness. No two patients ever displayed the exact same symptoms. Many had symptoms of those who had Parkinson's disease, tremors and shaking limbs. Others were frozen into whatever position they were placed, in essence becoming living statues. There's a famous case described in the literature of a man whose first manifestation occurred when he was playing cricket. When he suddenly had to leap up to, to catch a ball and he found himself stuck in this position. And, uh, and thereafter, whenever this particular movement was repeated, it was accompanied by, by a replay of the feeling that he had to catch a ball. It took Austrian doctor Konstantin von Economo two years to establish sleepy sickness as encephalitis lethargica, a disease which attached itself to the brain. One had the extraordinary situation of people who had all their, their higher faculties intact, their, uh, their intelligence, their judgment, their insight, their humor, but who were gripped by, by extraordinary base disorders of movement, posture, appetite, and mood, which they could witness, but uh, do nothing about. Then, in 1927, suddenly, mysteriously, sleepy sickness disappeared, leaving behind its survivors, who remained motionless and speechless, totally lacking energy and initiative. Dr. Sachs wrote, they neither conveyed nor felt the feeling of life. They were insubstantial as ghosts, suspended or asleep, awaiting an awakening. And they sort of vanished from social consciousness of medical consciousness they were put away they really became in a sense the lepers of, uh, of the century one sees again that uh, there's all over an enormous volume of, uh, uh, of interest and writing about these these people in the 1920s that by 1935 it had virtually ceased and uh, and although von Economo wrote at the height of the epidemic this time it won't be forgotten. It was forgotten. Most survivors recovered almost completely and returned to their former lives, only to develop the symptoms of a premature Parkinson's disease years later. One victim said, I cannot start and cannot stop. I no longer have any in-between states. Another wrote, I have no exit. I am trapped in myself. And this stupid body is a prison with windows, but no doors. His gaze from staring through the bars has grown so weary that it can take in nothing more. For him, it is as though there were a thousand bars, and behind the thousand bars, no world. As he paces in cramped circles over and over, his powerful strides are like a ritual dance around a center where a great will stands paralyzed. At times, the curtains of the eye lift without a sound, and a shape enters, slips through the tightened silence of the shoulders, reaches the heart, and dies. As their symptoms worsened, they were put away in hospitals, joining the other victims of the long-forgotten epidemic. He was just graduating high school. And he came home and he says, you know, he says, I can't clench my right hand so well. I said, look at all the books you're carrying. No wonder, you know, you probably, your hand must have fallen asleep. He says, no, it's about two weeks, but I didn't want to worry you. Well, and I started to run from one doctor to another. Seven years it took them to find out what was wrong with him. 
Well, how old were you, about 22? About 20, 22, I think. 23? 23. So he worked two years in City College. He was a, a library instructor. And his left side started up. Took a leave of absence, but that was the end of his career. I took care of him for 23 years, and I brought him over here because he started to fall. He couldn't, uh, I couldn't pick him up. He used to pick himself up, but then he couldn't. And then I got a nervous breakdown, and then I had to bring him over here. Because I always says, over my dead body, will I put him in an institution? But it was almost so. Lillian managed some light work at the hospital. She carried on a normal life until she felt a tremor in her leg. So he just kept getting worse and worse. We spread right up the, left, the right side, the left side, and then went down to the right side. And I was functioning until about 64. I had my kids in the house. But you got to a place where they were taking care of me, and better me take care of them. That was too much. So I had to break up the house again. Dr. Sachs placed all the sleepy sickness patients together in one ward. He discovered that although the patients seemed grossly disabled, for brief and amazing moments, they could rediscover their lost coordination. See, it's not just any music. It has to be the music that's right for them. It's like they only move by music that moves them. They'll sit there like that all day if I let them. Activate the first card. In 1967, Dr. George Coetzeus reported that a spectacular new drug called L-DOPA was successful in curing the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. L-DOPA was hailed as the miracle drug of our age. One knew that L-DOPA was useful in ordinary Parkinsonism of fairly mild degree and fairly short duration. Dr. Sachs' patients didn't have ordinary Parkinson's disease, but he decided to use L-DOPA not in the expectation of miraculous results, but as a last resort. What'll this medicine do for him? I don't know what it'll do for him, if anything at all. What do you think it'll do? I'm not sure because it was designed for a totally different disorder. What do you hope it'll do? I hope it'll bring him back from wherever he is. Most of Dr. Sachs' patients were deteriorating rapidly. None more dramatically than Lola, who was unable to swallow and threatened with starvation. She was first given L-DOPA in May 1969 in the hope of keeping her alive. It did more than that. Lola had been, had been transfixed in a state of extreme, really in a state of infinite Parkinsonism and catatonia for decades. And her change, her awakening, uh, occur, occurred in, in seconds. And she jumped out of the chair and she flew down the passage and she burst into conversation. And um, it, was, um, it was an incredible scene and I would doubt my own memory. Uh, were not supported by everyone else's memory, and of course by uh, um, by our accounts and films and so forth, which, which we took at the time. And the astonishing and amazing awakenings were repeated again and again. I had the strangest dream. I have the need of blood pressure. I've been sitting for 25 years in this direction. Are you okay? I need some more makeup. Okay, I think we can take care of that. And I need some dye for my hair. Black. Black? Rose, are you sure? Yes, it's always been black. Ed was so rigid he could barely lift a finger. After two weeks on L-DOPA, he was an active man, able to write, and within 20 days produced an autobiography where he wrote, with L-Dopa in my blood, there's nothing in the world I can't do. People have forgotten what life is all about. They've forgotten what it is to be alive. They need to be reminded. They need to be reminded about what they have and what they can lose. 
And what I feel is the joy of life, the gift of life, the freedom of life, the wonderment of life. But one of the most dramatic awakenings was with Sylvia. After 35 years in the hospital, frozen and inert, she regained the enthusiasm for life which had deserted her 40 years before. But something in her manner was strange. She's in a marvelous mood uh, for a while, and she, um, she was talking away and singing and dancing, but, but almost everything she, she said and did uh, had reference to, um, uh, to 1926 or before. She referred to figures who were topical at that time. Um, some, of her, some of her mannerisms, uh, some of her slang, was of a sort which had been obsolete for 40 years. She was, so to speak, a flapper who had come to life. Give me, give me, give me what I cry for. You know you got the friendly kisses that I die for. You know it made me love During the summer of 1969, the patient's gaiety and excitement filled the hospital. It felt at the time that it was, uh, uh, that it was the most extraordinary scene I'd ever witnessed. And, um, and I think perhaps now that I'm unlikely to witness such a scene again in, uh, uh, in my lifetime, the, this extraordinaryness was felt by everyone by the patients and by all of us who worked with them. I mean, at that point, it seemed that, um, uh, that there was a real possibility of these incredibly uh, wounded, uh, disabled patients who had been put away for so long. There seemed a real possibility that they might not only come to life again, but perhaps um, be able to lead for lives. Their reactions were best at that time and, and our hopes were highest. I think perhaps our hopes were somewhat exaggerated, but, uh, but certainly the summer of 69 was, was a time of election. By autumn, the first problems appeared. What if he's just had enough of it? Well, it's just a matter of time for all of us. There is no medical reason to think that what's happening to Leonard will happen to you. Why not? You're all individuals. And you're well. Aren't you? It was a sort of a medical or sleeping beauty problem. Uh, could a patient who's, um, uh, whose reality, whose living reality, belonged to 40 or 50 years ago, and who in a sense have been suspended or asleep. I don't mean literally asleep, but, but, uh, but in, uh, in abeyance for 40 or 50 years. Could such a patient accommodate to the time gap? Uh, could they understand it? Could they bear it? Um, or not? In, in the case of Sylvie, I think she couldn't. And, uh, and in a very remarkable way, after, after 10 days of uh, of, um, of her 1926 us, um, I think um, I think a sort of horror came over her, and shortly after this, she returned to her transfixed, blocked, and trance state, and uh, and subsequently nothing we could do, giving her a dope or anything else, could bash her. Just as in the summer, the patients delighted in each other's recovery. In the autumn, each setback triggered new disappointments. How's it going? How's it going? Yeah, how do you feel? Well, my parents are dead. My wife is in an institution. My son has disappeared out west somewhere. I feel old and I feel swindled. That's how I feel. Each patient, in turn, found the new life brought uncertainties that they'd been shielded from in their illness. I know what year it is. I just can't imagine being older than 22. I have no experience at it. I know it's not 1926. I just need it to be. 
too many of the threads had been broken. Even though they might have been doing well on the drug, to use the phrase of Robert Lowell's, they were still in a limbo of lost connections, social connections, uh, connections with their earlier selves. And, uh, and it was the, um, uh, the magnitude of this limbo, I think, which, 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 which appalled in the, in the latter months of uh, 69. Each patient's health deteriorated. Ticks, nightmares, and long-forgotten symptoms flourished, independently of the amount of L-Dopa administered. Dr. Sachs was faced with a drug that gave life to patients, and yet snatched it away again. Can you stop this? I'm not sure, but I'm trying. Don't give up on you. I won't. The other sort of problem one sees, uh, the so-called side effects, consists of the appearance of, um, of peculiar, um, unwanted, um, undesirable excitations of one sort or another, abnormal movements, uh, abnormal emotional excitements, and so forth. And uh, this would seem to be to go along with the, uh, with the idea that one can't affect one part of the brain without affecting another part of the brain. Anymore, you can throw a stone into a pond and not have ripples. In time, the patients learned to adapt to the disconcerting side effects of L-Dopa. One patient said, I'm perfect when everything is going smoothly, but I feel like I'm on a tightrope. If you ask whether L-Dopa is good or bad for me, I'd say both. It has wonderful effects, but there's a heck of a but. Everybody looks. Even nerves that aren't used to it. It's gonna take a lot of fun with it. She tried to shampoo my hair once she didn't have to move her hands. My head was moving. It got hysterical. As the drug wore off, Lillian would freeze, becoming once again a living statue. They take me and a few stone floor. They haven't moved. It's like they glued. There was no longer a miraculous cure, but a coming to terms with their disease, their own daily struggle. It was really, I think, the business not simply of uh, animating people with a chemical, but trying to create a life for them, or find the possibilities of a life. And what applies to them applies, applies to all of us. To have been frozen for 40 years and then awakened, it's an experience that's hard to imagine. Articles and a book written by Dr. Sachs helped to inspire a play by Harold Pinter, a television documentary, and 20 years later, the major motion picture, Awakenings. The pharmacist says to, to put all the others on the same dosage as Mr. Lowe would be in. 12,000. How much? $12,000. A month? Yes, I can't go before the board was at, Doctor. Perhaps if they see Mr. Lowe. I think you overestimate the effect that Mr. Lowe has on people, Doctor. We're talking about money. period it was a flower I mean like a miracle it was a miracle it was an incredible incredible thing that happened I love sleep. 
you're awake. That made me um, aware of something I never even knew about. And for Oliver Sacks to be involved in this momentary miracle yeah. was, um, you know, it's the experience of a lifetime. Not many people even experience it once. The world may now share in this experience, this miracle that gave not just Dr. Sachs and his patients, but the people who've come in contact with him as well, an intense feeling for the wonderment of life. The song at twilight, when the lights are low, and the flickering shadows softly come and go. Though the heart be weary, sad the day and long, still to us that twilight, and love those songs. Um, love's own sweet song. The only survivor who was involved in that original documentary is Lillian. And she participated in the making of the movie Awakenings. Upon her arrival to the set, Dr. Sachs wrote, it was like Caesar entering a set of Julius Caesar. Like someone stepping out of the pages of a history book. The filming needed her actual presence. We all had a feeling now. It has been some time. 